welcome to the Agile Camp Berlin. And the stage is yours. We're really looking forward to the to your talk, Evidence-Based Interventions. Just a bit of background to Victor. He's an experienced coach. Slack, IKEA, Spotify, just to name a few. And uh, he's an author of very worthy articles, frameworks, and other tools that will help you in your job. So I'm, I'm really excited to listen to him. And actually, this is, again, one of the first time that we do this. So hopefully we can, we will have some possibility to meet in, in person at a later stage, maybe next year, we will say. We've um, chatted for a long time, but we've never... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank, again, you for, thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Again, a good example for the uh, for the benefit of the hands-on Agile Slack group. So uh, yeah. consider joining it. It's really helpful. So enough talking. Victor, stage is yours. So uh, I'm Victor Sasson. I do systems coaching and agile coaching. Uh, I'm here today to talk about evidence-based interventions. And really, um, there are a lot of people who... Uh, I see as role models or mentors who've influenced me. And this is my, you know, how I have packaged things in my mind. And the people who have been like highly influential of uh, you know, how I conduct myself at companies or like clients or systems are people like Esther Derby or Jenny Weinberg, Dave Snowden and Donella with uh, Meadows and, you know, her systems thinking book and Virginia Satir. So really like for me, this is more their work that I have applied than anything that I have discovered or invented myself. And like the one thing really that, like the center of everything I'm gonna be talking about today is to intervene as coaches or scrum masters, because really, or as managers, that's really what I'm focusing this talk about or for. It's that we should intervene when we have a compelling case. Now, what's a compelling case? Is that if I see something and I disagree with it? No, that's not a compelling case. A compelling case is when we have a reason backed up by data. So an observation is data, but we then apply interpretation to it and we have some sort of logical framework and options. Because if we don't have any options, we're not really intervening. We're not making strategic interventions. We're just acting. So intervene when you have a compelling case. Now, evidence-based interventions is a clickbait title, but there's a very serious undertoning in it, which is that like, when we make these interventions, we need to have facts or information available that you know, motivates our actions. And if we can't motivate our actions, like if there is nothing that's indicating that our beliefs are true, then you know, we shouldn't be acting. And this is really important. Like I believe that we have, when we don't do this, we actually cause harm. So we really need to be careful with how we carry ourselves at companies within teams. And I wanna start with the takeaways that I'm gonna be talking about, and there are four. The first is like as coaches or scrum masters or managers, pay attention to how things are framed. You heard like the linguistics talk recently and or just before this and like how people express things really shapes the possibilities we have so pay attention to that and reframe to open up new possibilities that no one thought was possible when you're working with linear systems it's really important to find the confounding factors and that means we need to assign causality because otherwise we don't really know our interventions are not going to change anything and if you're working with a non-linear system we need to be thinking radically different. And I'm not going to be talking about that because that's Dave's area. Now, system traps is another thing we fall into a lot. And that's when we solve a problem in a system by creating a dependency towards us. And that's also something we need to be really careful with. And finally, like as coaches, scrum masters, managers, we need to work with systems in a structured way. So these are the four takeaways. And now I'm just going to be talking about different cases on how this plays out. So if we talk about the first one, like pay attention to framing and like reframe to open up new possibilities, there's this example I share when I do this talk, which is about Disney. And I read about this from someone who'd made a study on Disney, but I can't find it again. And now I don't know if I made this up or not, but I 
have asked some people who have been to Disney a lot and they're like, yes, that seems to match our experience. And some have said like, no, I'm not really sure. So I don't know. And if someone here has worked with Disney or been to Disney a lot, please contact me afterwards and tell me if I'm completely wrong because then I'll move this out. But so Disney was having like way back, we're having really big problems with queues. Huge queues would form. Um, people would you know, be excited about going to Disneyland. They would want to go to their favorite rides. Uh, but the parks held more people than the rides would hold, and the different rides had different like restrictions. And so what would happen is that lines would form, and people would stand in line, and they would have to wait. They would complain. And so, um, you know, what do we do about this? And people don't want to wait. So, you know, we could shorten the queues. We could reduce the amount of people in the parks. We could open more parks. We could have more... Um, rides but all of these options have really really negative implications on like the bottom line so these aren't great options but they kept on uh, exploring what is it that's actually happening and they found out that you know, the problem was that people get bored and they don't want to get bored now an entertainment company reframing a problem from people don't want to stand in line to people don't want to be bored opens up completely new options and so when they had this framing, they could suddenly like, okay, let's just give them entertainment in the queues. And they would add this entertainment in queues. So they would have, you know, theaters on the streets, they would have shops in the queues, they would have games in the queues. And so suddenly like queuing up wasn't a big problem. And so here the reframing opened up completely new possibilities. And when we think about, you know, how do we get requests? How are things framed to us as coaches or scrum masters or managers. Well, one of the most common one is like, hey, scrum master, X is not Y in this team, which is just a negation of state. Like there's very little context here. And sometimes you get like, hey, you know, Victor, can you do X in Y? Can you install agile in this team or make this team have a Kanban board or whatever, which is also like an instruction void of context. Sometimes you get requests like, can you fix, figure out, like, fix the reason for why this isn't happening? Like the team isn't reporting on their progress or the team isn't doing estimations or like the team isn't following up on their progress. Can you fix that? Figure out what's happening and fix that. Sometimes you're presented with hypotheses. And sometimes like when you're working with VPs or executives, they're quite distant from teams. And so they know that something is happening or something is not happening. They know there's just something, but they're not sure what. So it's like shredding his request. Help us even figure out, is this happening? Like, is this even a thing? And so it's really important to figure out like, what is the frame that I'm being presented with? Or how is the system framing its situation? And then work to, if you're getting requests that are sounding like the top, then you need to really like reframe that and if you're getting requests that are further down, like a hypothesis, work to prove or disprove the hypotheses so that you can either generate new hypotheses, which will open up new possibilities, or so that you actually can start acting on them. Okay, let's talk a little bit about linear systems. So like confounding factors are things that affect the pattern that you're seeing without it being evident. And this is like assigning causality really, but it's things that affect it which might not be obvious. So one request I got was, hey, Victor, uh, our standups are taking way too long. Can you help us shorten them? And I'm like, sure. And if you are, you know, when I ask scrum masters or coaches this, like, what are the reasons why standups are taking long? You know, the, the, the answers I get is like, oh, there's no time boxing, it's poorly facilitated, like the team doesn't know agile or something like that. And so in this case, this is the team's board and I was sitting there and I was watching them and the product manager came to me and said, you know, the standups are taking way too long. Now this is a big team. There were over 20 people. And so the first thing I explored was like, can we make the team smaller? And they were like, no, we can't. Okay, cool. And they couldn't because they were innovating, they were developing something completely new. So they needed lots of different expertises collaborating together. And so like, okay, we can't make it smaller. And then the product manager said, like, but they're just bad at running standups. And that's because they don't know Agile. So please train them in Agile. And so I said, OK, sure. Let me just watch them for a week. And then after that, we can chat. And so after a few days, 
I saw that, you know, the team is actually following yesterday. I did this today. I'm going to do this. And, you know, I have no impediments or like I have these impediments. Can someone please help me? And so, okay, if that's happening, the team is obviously not bad at running standups, which means that, you know, the hypothesis that they don't know standups, so they're bad at running standups, so we should train them in standups so, and they'll understand it. That can't be true. So what is it that's going on? And in the standup, uh, the updates were done individually. You know, 20 people, 23 people, I believe, were standing in a half circle around the board, and they would do their updates. So the first person would go and start yesterday, et cetera, et cetera. Second person would go, third person would go, fourth person would go, and then the fifth person would say something. And then the first person would say, oh, by the way, yes, you, you remind me now. And then we'd go back to the fifth person. And then the sixth person would say something. And then we'd jump back, oh, to the second person. Oh, by the way, I remember. And then they would jump back and forth between people. And the way we had structured everything else in this team was that we had structured everything around goals. The smallest unit in this team was trios or quartets. So people would work in small groups. But here, suddenly, we were asking people to talk individually rather than collectively. And so that created this jumping back and forth. And you know, maybe I should just stop them. Like you can only speak once. But that's not really great because they need to chat. And so what we did rather was that we organized, since the board was organized around goals, and since we had like a collective approach where like the, the smallest unit was teams, we rather went goal by goal, right to left. And so the way we had asked people to structure their work and the way we asked them to talk about their work didn't align. And so when I saw this, I told them like, hey, it looks like you're being asked to report individually for something you are not working on individually. Let's shift the format. And we did that and overnight it dropped down to sometimes under 15 minutes. And this is an example of people would converge around their problems much, much faster. This would sometimes spawn, hey, we four sh should meet afterwards and talk about this, cool. And, and this is like an example of how we not only reframe a situation, but we also assign causality. So from like team doesn't know agile, they're bad at running standups and therefore standups take time too. We've structured the standups to be in direct conflict with every other structure we have. And we need to align the structures. The interventions become completely different when you assign this causality. So, you know, confounding factors is about finding what is these hidden factors influencing the pattern that you're seeing. Where is the causality? Avoiding system traps. If we look at the example I just talked about, there are a lot of different things I could have done. I could have trained the team in Agile. I could have stopped them from jumping back and forth. I could have started facilitating the standups for them every morning. I could have you know, attempted to make the team smaller, or I could have changed the format. If I would have jumped into and started facilitating the meeting, they would probably have become shorter, not that much shorter. They might have become you know, 30 minutes long or something, or you know, if I was lucky, 20 minutes long. But that would have created a dependency to me. The team would not be able to proceed without me being there cons consistently. And so when we're working with a system, it's really important to strengthen the system's ability to manage itself rather than jumping in and asserting myself as a problem solver. To change the system so that it can function without you. Another example for like avoiding system traps is a request that I got. Like our teams are not agile, make them agile. And if we look at where we started, like this is not uncommon. I, I think if you're working as a scrum master or coach, you've probably heard this request sometime. And a lot of people are nodding. And so first of all, this is a negation of state with an instruction. Like is agile really desirable? What, you know, I don't know. Will Agile really solve your problems? What is the Agile definition for you? And you know, so there's a lot of like context that's missing here. And therefore, it's also a lot of possibilities, evolutionary possibilities are missing. So I would explore, okay, so tell me more. Like, what does this mean? Well, they're not collaborating. Oh, okay, cool. When are they not collaborating? And what happens as a result? And so we would explore this. But okay, tell me more. Well, the product owners are bad at running planning meetings. Okay, how do you know? Well, because they take so long time and like the stuff going into the sprint is not what comes out of the sprint. Oh, okay, cool. And they're bad at running Scrum because they violate their backlog. Oh, okay, cool. And also think about the language here that's being used, like asserting or like placing the blame on the team. 
And then like, oh, and also some teams don't even have a backlog. They're just doing lots of work and we have no idea what it is. And so like team performance is low when we get these poor deliveries. Oh, okay, cool. Now, if I would have taken things like at face value, which is like what they ask me for, I might have gone in and facilitated stand-up meetings or planning meetings or, but what I wanted to figure out was like what this pattern looked like. And here, what I found, I'm gonna show you what I found. This is actually an example from another organization, but it's the similar pattern. But I could do a lot of things, help them focus, teach them Scrum. And some of these things would be create the dependency to me. And I don't want that. But so what I found in this organization was that there were extensive dependencies. So like, rather than our teams are not agile, make them agile is like, yeah, maybe we should just reduce the dependencies. So the reason why things aren't like, why teams are having an issue locking scope isn't because they don't know how to do standups, it's because they need each other to deliver and realize value. And so in, in this organization that I'm showing you here, we started looking at classes of service from Kamba, which is a way to prioritize when you get lots of different work with different consequences if they're not done. And we also worked to reduce the dependencies and we also created a clearer strategy, like we amplified the context so that it would be easier to make trade-off decisions. So from our teams are not agile, make them agile to, hey, you know, we need to help our teams make better trade-off decisions. We need to give them context and we need to reduce the dependencies. Like that's a huge reframing. And also like the dependency on me looks completely different than if I would have gone into maybe two or three teams and started facilitating meetings. So, uh, you know, avoid system traps. Another example, which is quite recent, is an organization that went from being technology driven to product driven. They'd done lots of changes uh, over the past few years before I had joined. And uh, every change they had made to their organizational structure had weakened or service ownership. And when I'm talking about services here, it refers to microservices. So it's like components, systems, it's a technical aspect of service. And like, hey, Victor, you're an agile coach. You've been at lots of places. One of the most common things I've been is like, oh, you've been at Spotify, how should we do it? Which is like completely irrelevant because it's not gonna be work for you. Whatever worked there was not gonna work for you. And also I don't have a technical background. So like any advice I would give on like how to do technical architecture is gonna be really, really bad. But so like help us decide what to do. And so I would talk to people, I would talk to a couple of people and I would say, well, tell me more about this. And they would say, hey, you know, this is happening here and we are having some issues with this. And you know, when this happens to me, I would have these issues. And so they would share some stories. And it quite early became evident to me that everyone is talking about different things. And so I launched a study here, heavily inspired by ethnographic interviews, and where I interviewed senior developers, VP of engineering, uh, engineering managers, and we had a script that was transcribed. I stated my um, insights. I got them peer reviewed by a UX researcher. So it was quite serious. And what I found was like, among these 16 people, there were 52 definitions of what service ownership means. One of the insights was like, the reason why you can't figure out how what service ownership should look like right here is because you're not talking about the same thing. And then we would look at, so how is this pattern playing itself out? Well, you know, um, there's, it's difficult when we're product driven, making technical improvements is difficult because it's difficult to get buy-in when a technical improvement affects multiple teams. Okay, cool. And our organization is emphasizing valuing, delivering value to the customers rather than delivering technical like stability, et cetera. Okay. And the, you know, Back in the days, we might push out things that had poor quality, but we knew that we would get slack in between like initiatives, projects, and we could fix our like code degradation then. And so a culture of rewrites had formed. But now they were in a situation where significant like improvements are not being made because they don't have slack. The context of the customer is super clear. And so this led to like fear, uncertainty, doubt. People became cynical, code degraded, motivation degraded, employees were leaving, and the customer experience was like getting hurt. And so what we did about this is first we tried to 
meet on a couple of occasions and see, you know, one of the problems is you have 52 definitions. And another problem is that technical improvements aren't being made. Like, what do you think we should do about this? But it was really hard for everyone to agree because everyone had these different languages. And so we created a forum called Engineering Operations. And Engineering Operations was a forum, an opt-in forum, open for all, where we would add basically constraints until the group started solving tech these problems that they were having. One of the first constraints we added was the way we make decisions is consent decision making. So it's consensus, like everyone is by default agreeing with the decision. And if you disagree, you need to like have a valid objection. And we had examples of what valid objections were. It would also supposed to be completely tension and friction based, not opportunity based. We had an onboarding process for everyone that wanted to join. So they would have to sit in and like understand and listen. If you join two or three months later, you would have to like get educated in the process. The meetings happened bi-weekly. There was an external facilitator, me. And if you're thinking, but you said there should be no dependencies, you're right, and we'll get to that in a bit. We said that anything you bring up here should only affect macro, and you need to have a proposal. And a proposal had a very, very specific structure. It had a background, a problem statement, a goal statement, and a proposed solution. So you had to sit and think about a solution that you thought would be helpful. So you had to articulate the problem and articulate how you thought that the problem should be solved. And then the group would start off there and see if they could improve it or if there were some significant holes. And out of this, like service ownership is not working here, we got things like, here's how we onboard backend developers. Here's how we should talk to customers. Here's how we should name channels on Slack. We need to have a technical hack week where we can actually focus on fixing these areas of the code. Uh, we should read the book Team Topologies. All of these things came out and much, much more. And none of that we could have found through the like framing of um, we can't figure out what service ownership should look like right here. And then we had lots of transparency. Now, going back to the like, hey, Victor, you said that you shouldn't create a dependency to you. I have left this place and it's almost two years later and they're still following that process and they're still solving like macro problems in this group. When I just handed over the process to a, an engineering manager and she took over. So there is no dependency to me. I helped them get it started and then I handed it over. And it was also based on like, I was trying to hand over ownership earlier, but it didn't work. So I would, uh, I would wait or I would go forward and back, forward and back until I could leave it over. Some problems are also harder to solve without creating a temporary dependency to you. But so like solve problems, be careful about the system trap. Okay, point four is working with the system in a structured way. Now, a system is a group of interacting entities. They're interrelated and they form a unified whole. Some holes are discernible and some aren't. And like the insights we generate about the system need to be based on like data and observations. We can't just like intuitively go around thinking we know a system. And we need to reduce bias. We're never going to get rid of it, but we need to take actions that reduce our bias, which could a peer review process could be a thing, but also looking at a situation, visualizing a system could also be a way to visualize or like reduce dependencies. Working with hypotheses that you try to disprove is also a way to reduce biases. And when we make interventions based on compelling evidence, they are going to be more effective and they're gonna be more likely to help you avoid the system traps. And there are two ways that we can study and work with the systems. The first is qualitative studies. Qualitative studies is when we do things that help us get an understanding of a system. I'd say that most of you probably do this today in an informal way. When you join a team, you probably have conversations to everyone in the team. Uh, with everyone and say, hey, you know, can you tell me more about this team? What's it like? Uh, you know, what's your history like? You're having these casual chats. And as you chat to them, you're getting context. And slowly but surely, a hypothesis starts to form and possibly. You might also like 
it depends on if you're taking an observational stance or if you're taking a participatory stance. In the example with the interviews about service ownership, I had some conversations. I was not in a research role and they would come to me saying, hey, Victor, this is happening, help us solve it. And then I would shift into structured and interviewing. I would run these group conversations. I also facilitated some meetings where they were trying to resolve technical differences across teams to see how is this playing out. So I was having a highly participatory role. And sometimes my research role was very evident and sometimes it wasn't. And then once you start to get in hypotheses, you can move into using quantitative data, which is what you use to prove or disprove your ideas. Now, a lot of us, we go into an organ, we try to look at JIRA or we try to look at repos, et cetera. And that's great after we, but only if we have the uh, hypotheses, because otherwise we're really, really going to be prone to bias. So first hypotheses, then data. And like, this is one of the big revelations for me was like how much data there is available. There is so much available and we just need to know what question to ask, which is the big problem often. So then we go into like analysis and interpretation and diagnosis. And here's also one thing like I'm, you know, I'm doing agile coaching, but less and less of when I'm working with systems is about agile and more and more I, I turn to science. Like if you're having issues with, you know, motivation is dropping, there is self-determination theory that you can use as a framework to understand. You don't need to invent a new framework. You could just look at the scientific literature that exists there. And, you know, psychological safety, there exists frameworks there. So you don't need to invent something cool there. But it's also really important to decide what abstraction are you looking at? Are you looking at a team? Actually, are you looking at an individual or a team? or an entire area or an entire company, because you're gonna to need to use different frameworks and you're gonna need different data sample sizes. So explore the context, the frame, decide the extraction, review the scientific literature and then reevaluate. So you're gonna to need to keep yourself up to date. Um, there are a lot of outdated frameworks still being used. And there are a lot of frameworks like psychometric frameworks that are being tried to use for like group dynamics and that just doesn't work. So like use appropriate methods for appropriate problems. And as a tip, study anthropology and like ethnographic interviews. If you're a coach, pair up with a UX researcher, like these are great things. We have so much as coaches to get from this. Now, once you have your qualitative, like once you've done these interviews or whatever, like conversations, you might have like facilitated meetings. Once you've gotten your hypotheses and you have some data, and you've analyzed this, you need to figure out how to visualize. And there are lots of different ways to visualize what's happening. Like if you're trying to visualize events, chains of events, you might wanna use a timeline or a fishbone. And I'm doing this pattern matching. I'm not gonna go through what these looks like, but I'm doing this so that you can Google like, oh yes, I'm actually, I, I wanna visualize events. So then you can use timelines or fishbones. If you wanna look at, the relationships like influencing factors or iceberg model or causal loop diagrams can be really helpful. And learning these different ways to visualize what's happening is going to be great at creating a shared understanding. It helps you develop a shared language with the system and you invite people to change the shape of your visualization. So like inclusiveness is much easier if you create something together and you're visualizing it and you're opening it up for being changed based on other people's experiences. So decide on a way to visualize, use a method that is appropriate for what you're trying to visualize. And this is really hard. You might want to, you might need to try a few different ways of visualizing something. I still do this. I try, oh, I'm gonna use an iceberg. Now actually that really doesn't say anything and this doesn't work. Okay, I'm gonna try this. And then you find something that, oh, this actually does help me articulate something that I'm seeing, or like this helps me articulate what they've been talking about. So now I wanna just reiterate the takeaways before we move into some examples and some other examples. So the first was like, pay attention to how things are framed for you. And using qualitative and quantitative studies help the system reframe a situation so that you get new possibilities. If you're working with a linear system, an open system, or if you're working with an order system, then pay attention to the, find the confounding factors, sign causality, then you act. 
avoid system traps, and work with and work in a structured way. And now I just want to like take another few cases and show you like from the frame to the frame and what opportunities that opened up before we move into Q&A. So one client approached me and said, hey, Victor, our teams are delivering components. They're not solving customer problems. Help us figure out why. It's not an unreasonable request. And it's also no, like, they're not bad, there's nothing good here, there's no blame here, it's like we need to figure out why. And so we used John Cutler's framework about product autonomy. Like again, why develop something new if something decent exists that can tell a story? So John Cutler is a project evangelist at Amplitude, love his work, and he talked about like work is expressed in different levels of autonomy to teams. And so we just surveyed the organization, like how is work expressed to you? And you know, ABC is very, very low autonomy. Teams don't have significant amounts of autonomy. And this organization found out that you know, over half of their organization was getting instructions on exactly what to do. And, how, uh, and this allowed us to reframe from like uh, our teams are delivering components to we're actually asking our teams to deliver components. Like this is a huge shift. So now we're taking the responsibility from the team and we're assigning the accountability to, to ourselves. And this is something we can do. This is something a management team can do something about. What, you know, what should we be asking them to deliver instead? Help us figure that out. Okay, cool. Now let's you know, look at your strategy. Let's look at your product vision and then let's see how we can diffuse this into the organization. Another example is a team approached me and said, hey, Victor, our performance is really low. And uh, like, can you help us figure out why? So it wasn't management, it wasn't a VP, it was the team that approached me. And so I went into, and I did a qualitative study here. I got their permission to run interviews with them uh, and to present what I found. Here are some quotes that I would get in the interviews. Like, we're not making progress. And like, I really like the purpose, why we exist as a team. And I want to stay in this team, like with this purpose. But like, what we're here to do is super unclear. And you know, going to work every day, not knowing what I'm going to do, it really takes all of my energy. People are great, mission are great, but for some reason we're just unable to, you know, deliver. And then, like, if I look at what we deliver, at best, I think we're like meh. But if I look at our potential, it's closer to five. We have all the competencies we need. We all understand the context. We're not collaborating, and we need to collaborate more. Okay, cool. And so I, you know, asked, what are the things that give, have a positive impact and what are the things that have a negative impact on you? And they would say, you know, anytime we talk about process, all of my energy is drained. And every time we explore our goals and we talk about our purpose, I get energy. And every time we do socializations, like that also gives me energy. And then I said, okay, cool, let's look at your calendar. And we would look four weeks back. And the majority of their meetings were about process. So this was like an eye opener, like, oh, what should we be talking about instead? Now it went from our performance is really low, help us figure out why, to like we're not getting the context we need to be able to solve customer problems. Again, this is something we can do something about. In the same team, we also had another situation which was like, we have rigid subgroups that have formed in our team. Okay, cool. And so I did an uh, organizational network analysis in the team. It was a very simplified one. And so I'm using Game of Thrones names here for, to protect their integrity. And so this is what it looked like. We could see here that there are two subgroups. Like we have the top left one, and then we have the bottom right one, and then Tyrion is just outside everything. And so this in visualization helped them reframe themselves from this to this. Like, hey, we have these mini teams, and we could actually get started at working on something, but like, what problems should we give them? And so the product owner then said, like, okay, you know, we actually have something that's really important, valuable, that matches these competencies. And Tyrion was uh, moved into the Sansa group. So this was a huge shift. And this was not my suggestion. This was how they proposed to solve the problem. If this would have been my way of solving it, I would have just said, oh, we need to have a kickoff and we need to get to know each other better because that's what I've been taught to do, right? If you don't know each other, you're not going to be working with each other. But here was like, hey, you know, we actually have this opportunity. We could just give them work and they can get started day one. 
So that was pretty cool, I think, a cool solution by them. Now, I think the last example I want to talk about is one when I was working with a network team, a network data center team, and they were uh, building data centers. And one, they had a new realization that changes take too long. So, hey, Victor, changes are taking too long. Like, what can we do? How can we change our process? And I was like, I don't know, but we can start measuring your process. And we measured the process. It was, we, we measured how long it took to build a new rack. And it took on average 32 working days. And we would track, you know, how long does every step take? We found that it was 20 days of waiting time. And, you know, why do we have this waiting time? Well, it's because when we install, when we order the network stuff and we get to the network data center, we almost always are missing network cables because we, we can't order them. Okay, so what happens then? Well, then we add an order for network cables and we have to wait a couple of weeks and then we go back to the data center and install it. And then we said, well, okay, sounds like you have inventory starvation. And so that's creating lead times. So from very long lead times to we're having inventory starvation, which opened up to, you know, a network cable doesn't really cost anything. Why don't we just buy in a hundred of them and always have a hundred of them at the, in our data centers? And we did. And that's how they solved their problem instead of going in and teaching them agile. And so like the way we frame our problems really limits the possibilities we see. And one of the great contributions we can have as coaches or scrum masters or managers is helping a system reframe the presence so that new possibilities can open up. And with that said, uh, thank you. And let's open up for Q&A. Let's see, we can check the Slack channel and we have one from mm -hmm. Natalia. Which psychological safety scientific models are your favorite? Um, I think when it comes to the workplace, uh, the work Amy Edmondson has done is great, where she's proven, been able to like prove her hypotheses. So just no reason to re, uh, re-innovate something or like rediscover something, read her work. It's great. And I think actually that's the only scientific research available in the subject to even give her more credit. We have one from Matthias here. Let's assume you're already inside a system trap and everyone except you is totally fine with it. What is your suggestion to get out of it? Great question. Um, first thing is like, are you comfortable with being in that position? Like, are you comfortable with being a permanent member of that system? If yes, no, no problem. If like, no, actually we you know have a shortage of coaches in our system and we need to move them from team to team, then you could have a conversation about, uh, about that with the team. Like, hey, in one or two months, I'm going to need to shift team. Can we talk about the things that I'm doing and see create a handover plan to you and uh, see what happens? If there's no problem, don't solve it, basically. Alexandra, you had one question in Slack. Isn't this more of a status meeting where the team reported progress rather than discuss about their progress on the sprint goal, issues they have, and if they are still on track? Is this in relation? Alexandra, do you want to? Yeah, this refers to, um, uh, I remember um, it was towards the beginning of the presentation when you mentioned that the uh, team was taking, uh, I believe, 15 minutes, but they were going through like uh, each person stating what uh, they accomplished uh, a day before, what they are going to focus on today and whether they had impediments or not. Yeah. And you were going person by person. I mean, they were going person by person. Um, so like... Another way to express it would be like what was happening was that when every person would, uh, when they would jump between people, they would context switch. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so one problem we solved was like reducing the context switching. The other problem we solved was that everyone doesn't have to speak. Like if, if your goal has been covered, what, there's no point in you adding something or repeating something. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the me meeting became much more about what you're saying, like, hey, how's it going? Like, who needs to help out who? Like, what anomalies have we discovered? Like, we don't have any anomalies. Like, here's what we're doing. Um, is there anyone that, like, cares about this? Reach out to us afterwards. We're moving on to this aspect of the product. And then someone would say, hey, you know, uh, we have designed this new uh, design now, and we want to test it out on this device. And then some people would say, oh, okay, cool. We'll jump, we'll jump in and join you. So context switching was reduced and it went from that status meeting to um, convergence. 
But linked to that, you also mentioned that uh, you didn't want to actually start involving yourself and facilitating the meeting yes. in order to um, improve the way the team was uh, holding their uh, stand-up meeting uh, because uh, in your opinion, that would have created a dependency on yourself? Yes, and I would have been okay with doing that if I would have had data indicating that that was a, a reasonable intervention. Um, so first figure out what is it that's happening. And it might be that they need that, but no data indicated that there is a, a competency issue here with facilitating meetings or communicating. Rather, the structure was impeding them from collaborating. So rather than jumping in directly, if I would have jumped in directly and taken over the facilitation stance, I would not have been able to observe the system in its natural state. No, actually, I'm not quite sure you were still in the meeting, but just as an observer. Yes, it's I was just actually. That you yeah. didn't intervene. Yes, I was actually sitting. Okay. I was actually sitting like two meters uh, away from the team, sitting down. Okay. They knew that I was there. Um, okay. Because that was where my desk was. There's another question from Alex. Um, let me quote. In section three, the engineering ops question, the rule was macro issues only. Thinking about my organization where. Uh, there would be a lot of micro issues raised. Any tips for steering the mindset uh, level up? I can tell you how we reasoned. Uh, that's what I can tell you. And also, I didn't give you a disclaimer when I talked about engineering ops. I, I think that no one should ever copy that solution. It's really a very, very tailored solution that worked for that specific org, culture, problems, stack, uh, group of people. Um, but rather like the discovery process of how we got to engineering ops is probably a good thing to copy, like doing qualitative studies and quantitative uh, studies. But so like, how do we resolve micro issues? Uh, at Avanza Bank, the way we did that was we strengthened the local leadership team, uh, which means like the leaders around the team got uh, a greater mandate to resolve their issues. Um, so like implement a heuristic that allows the teams to solve their problems, which is one way of saying set enabling constraints to, uh, to allow for local variation. So when the variation is not neg has, when the variation in a team does not have a negative impact on the entire macro system, that's a great thing to solve in the team. When the whatever you do, like, oh, we want to change our entire release cycle in our team, and that's going to have a negative impact on every other team. Well, then maybe you should take that as a macro thing outside of your own team. But it, like, hey, we want to release on Thursdays instead of Wednesdays. Cool, do it. So like. Make the mandate clear, I would say, and set this set these enabling constraints that fits your context. And who knows what enabling constraints are are accurate for or correct for you? I have no, like you need to figure that out in, in your context. And it's not that simple. So I have full respect for like if you're sitting there like, oof, how do I do that? I have full uh, respect for that and like sympathy for that. So I, I basically said. That, I don't know, and I don't in your context. Like, but I think it's a really good, uh, even that is a really good realization. Like, hey, actually, our biggest tensions don't happen on a macro level. They happen on a micro level. Oh, cool. Maybe have a conversation about that. Um, at one point in time, you mentioned that um, you were discussing with uh, the management, or maybe I misunderstood senior people. What should you ask? the teams to deliver a component yeah. or so um, should I understand that uh, this was maybe a very large project and you still had com component teams or I didn't quite get how, how the team were uh, formed. Yeah. Um, this was an organization that did deliver things in projects and they were organized mm -hmm. around technical components uh, and you know, what comes first, like the chicken or the e egg? And, and in this case, it's like, um, you know, did they become a project org before they had component teams or did they become component teams because they had a project structure? I don't know. But when I was brought in, like when they said, hey, can we get your help? Uh, the request I was that, that I got, a little bit paraphrased, was more or less like our teams are delivering components and 
you know, we want them to actually focus on customer problems. Um, can you help us figure out why this is? Like, you know, when we give them customer problems, they're kind of anti that. Um, and what we found out was they're actually not giving them customer problems. They're actually giving them in their through their structure. They're giving them. Uh, they're assigning them technical work to do. And so mm -hmm. in order to change that, we also needed to change the structure of the teams because we can't give a technical component team a customer problem to solve. Um, and, but it all started with like, what are those customer problems we want to solve? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, then when, once they had this realization, they had to figure that out. And that's something they can't throw onto the teams. They have to figure that out because that's an investment decision. Like, where do we want to invest? But um, did you encounter problems in assuming that the organization allowed you or agreed with the team being reorganized as, let's say, functional uh, cross-functional teams? Yeah. Uh, have you had issues around the architecture? Yes. The technical so, uh, architecture? I mean, uh, I'm talking because usually... These type of problems are when, uh, and it's like a traditional organization usually have monolithic architectures. And um, to be able to move maybe to product mindset or even a project and cross-functional teams, they have to invest in uh, rewriting infrastructure uh, code, um, make it service-based uh, or object-oriented. And that's, that's a, a pure technical investment that some organizations are not willing to make. So, so this is the organization that I mentioned in in my like st uh, studies about service ownership. This this organization did have a microservice uh, architecture. Uh, they had oh, they also had uh, two monoliths left, but most teams didn't touch them. So that wasn't the big issue. It was it, it was a it was a issue, but not the biggest issue. However. To answer the like the other question you asked, like what was the response to shifting from being technical to like what was the response from teams getting technical component specs to getting like uh, customer problems to solve? And that is some teams liked it, some teams didn't. Uh, most teams were like oscillating in between. Um, so it was not like oh yes, please give us more customer problems to solve because there's huge. <laughs> Uh, huge gratification from like solving technical problems that you understand. If you are an engineer and you get like an engineering problem and you solve it, you go home and you're so happy. And now suddenly you get a problem that you don't know how to solve and you have to collaborate with people in outside of your expertise area. And like you, you have a massive impact on people's motivation when you make this shift. So uh, it wasn't, it was not like a, romantic story where everyone just like was super happy afterwards. And it's never been the case in any organization I worked in. Some have taken it better and some have taken it worse. And yeah, most most oscillate in between. Have you used a particular framework? Because no. I'm assuming there are more teams uh, working on the same project, let's say. I, I don't use, uh, so I do context specific, uh, like that's one of the things, like context specific coaching. So. Uh, I don't use any particular product model, but uh, in this example, we read uh, Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry, and we used the North Star framework by Amplitude. So these were the two like uh, artifacts or frameworks that we found to be helpful in their context, given their technical architecture, given their customer market. Um, so we had book clubs, and we read those books uh, all across the well, I would say at least 30% of the organization read it, like several team members from every team. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. And it's something probably I should be looking into. There should have been some type of, like, uh, I'm not sure what framework you are uh, familiar with or uh, like something like Nexus. I mean, they have to have some type of, I shouldn't be saying necessarily structure, I'm more saying like they have to have some events, they have to have some artifacts, they have to have some uh, requirements somewhere in a product backlog. You have yeah. to use a minimalistic framework uh, to get multiple teams to produce something. Yeah, so when we reduced the dependencies, the the uh, we talked more in terms of like uh, principles and uh, 
guidelines. So it, we want we did not want to standardize because standardization removes evolutionary potential. So we wanted to give teams the ability to adapt according to what they needed. So we worked a lot on clarifying context. And then we set some organizational constraints, like you can only work in one team and you and your team need to have a process that fits your product, et cetera, et cetera. So they got some constraints like that, uh, rather than like you need to uh, work uh, according to like Nexus or Scrum or whatever. There was also a, a demo every second week, but it wasn't uh, mandatory. It was like, we have a demo every second week, feel free to use it. And it was almost always full of people in the different teams demoing. Uh, that was that became like a huge celebration uh, uh, arena. Um, but no, we didn't want to standardize. We actually wanted to avoid standardization and rather work with like enabling constraints to allow the teams to form processes that fit them, which causes problems of its own also, yes. Uh, but deviation kills innovation, um, standardization kills innovation. Uh, so standardization is really harmful. Thank you for having me. And like, if you uh, if you if you'd like to continue the conversation, add me on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter and chat to me there. And uh, yeah, uh, it was great being here. Thanks a lot. Please check also uh, the uh, the page on uh, Victor's uh, talk on the blog. Uh, you will find a lot of more information on there, um, how to reach them, where to find them, etc. RPP. Victor, thank you so much. That was awesome. A true pleasure. No, that was uh, much appreciated. Thank you for, for making time for us. That was really awesome. It was a pleasure being here.